Okay, it's uh, 9.02 a.m. Singapore time, so uh, let's get started. I think we have a good group of people that have uh, signed on, so um, let's let's get the get the ball rolling and dive right into this. Uh, if um, appreciate everyone for taking the time uh, to attend this webinar. This is the first of, I believe, many webinars to come uh, from us at Structure Research. Uh, we recently just published the Singapore uh, the ECI report update um, earlier last month, um, and also it was Singapore's National Day last week. Uh, so I thought it was the perfect time to do a a webinar on the Singapore market. Uh, my name is Jabez Tan. I'm the head of research at Structure Research. Uh, we're an industry focused um, research firm um, that covers the internet infrastructure space. So uh, think cloud, data centers, and the ecosystem surrounding that. So here's the flow of the presentation, just to give you guys a quick sense. Um, we're not gonna take up too much of your time. It's gonna be 20 minutes of material. Uh, I've tried to condense a 120 page report into um, you know, some quick highlights worth 20 minutes, and then we're gonna end the time with a Q&A session, uh, maybe set aside five to 10 minutes to answer some of your questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So it's gonna be relatively um, quick hitting uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground. So uh, with that, uh, let's get started. So I wanted to take a step back before we dive into Singapore and just contextualize where Singapore sits in the broader picture of APAC and also the, the broader picture of the global data center market. And so um, at, by the end of 2019, um, you can see that the US or the North America market uh, accounted for 40% of uh, co-location revenues as of 2019. So it's still ahead of the Asia Pacific market, 40% uh, to 36%, and then you have EMEA at 23. Um, but by 2021, the Asia Pacific region will surpass the North America market in terms of market size. Um, and as you can see in 2024, uh, you, we have the projections there that the Asia Pacific region will account for 40% of the global uh, data center co-location market. So just a testament to um, the combination of both mature core growing markets in Asia PAC, as well as some of the developing high growth emerging markets uh, in the region as well to help really bolster that market share and growth rate in the region. Uh, so looking at it from a country standpoint, I'm not, I know I'm not highlighting every country in APAC, but just kind of the main countries that um, we've done some market market sizing exercises on. Uh, you can see that China, obviously the largest market in the world uh, are, are in Asia Pacific region, followed by Japan. And then you have Australia and Singapore, number four, followed by Hong Kong, India, South Korea, Indonesia. Um, and so what I will say is that, you know, Singapore is a pretty large market relative to its size. Um, but I do expect markets like India, uh, South Korea and Indonesia to really start to climb up the ranks in the next, call it three to five years, as uh, we're going to see more and more hyperscale activity and more and more data center deployments in those markets moving forward. Um, so it's a little bit unfair to compare Singapore to other countries because Singapore is both a, a, a city state and a country. Um, so we kind of look at it, you know, I think the better representation is to look at it on a per market uh, standpoint. Um, you know, Singapore is number two. I, I know we're excluding China and India for this, so, so just bear with me. But you know, Tokyo is still the largest market um, in, uh, from, from this chart, uh, followed by Singapore, Hong Kong, Sydney, Seoul. And then you have some kind of secondary country markets like Osaka and Melbourne that are starting to really um, see some hyperscale activity there. And, and Jakarta is another market that we're really focused on. Um, Phil, who's our founder and managing director, has uh, done a lot of groundwork on the Jakarta market. So expect some um, studies on the Jakarta market uh, in the near future. Okay, so Singapore. Uh, how big is the market? How fast is it growing? Uh, what is a quick overview of the market? Uh, we're roughly at about $1.6 billion in market size um, as of this year in 2020. Uh, and we project uh, 11, about a 10 year, 10% CAGR and over the next five years, primarily driven by the hyperscale vertical. As you can see, um, hyperscale right now accounts for over 56% of the market. You know, it was 50-50 in 2017, and because of the way it's been outpacing retail co-location growth, hyperscale is now um, the, the biggest driver of growth in the Singapore market. And that's true for many other markets across uh, Asia Pacific as well, as well, and not just Singapore, but Singapore really, um, the, the market that, has, that really started it all on the hyperscale side. And looking at it from a uh, critical IT load capacity, which is really how we like to measure data center markets uh, 
internally from a structured research point of view, um, we've really started to refine the way we look at these markets in terms of capacity. In the past, we only looked at what the currently built out capacity was and what the contracted capacity was. Um, but I think as the market evolves and gets more and more sophisticated and investors and, and operators and, and, and stakeholders are getting better at understanding the market and, and how it's growing and developing, uh, we've expanded that capacity tracking to include um, other metrics like max built out capacity and total capacity. So max built out capacity means um, the currently built out capacity plus if um, existing data center sites were to fully build out the rest of their space. So let's say um, you have a 10 megawatt data center, only five megawatts can come online as a phase one build. Um, that will be five megawatts for currently built out capacity and 10 megawatts for max built out capacity. So moving on to the total capacity, it's everything that max built out capacity is, but you we take into account land banks and also uh, new sites under development. So that, that gives you a real true picture of how big this market is and can be potentially. Uh, and then we actually project that moving forward. So if you look at the chart, you can see that it's roughly pretty stagnant between uh, from until 2021, given the current moratorium in place in the Singapore market where there's no new builds um, allowed to be developed until then. And so that's why you kind of see that flat line at 656 megawatts of total capacity. And then moving on uh, from then, we, we do expect the government to relax its restrictions and um, start to see some new, new kind of builds come online. And I know this is a pretty conservative estimate. Uh, chances are these, uh, what will actually happen in terms of new builds will likely surpass these estimates, but we like to play relatively conservative here uh, internally. So Singapore market, um, we kind of look at it in terms of three different regions. We have the east, the west, and the north region. Um, as you can see, the majority of the capacity right now is located um, on the eastern side of Singapore. Um, and, and we'll kind of drill into why that is in the coming slides. Uh, so looking at the distribution of data centers in Singapore, you can see that um, the where most of the data centers are located um, kind of correlates to where the carrier hotel locations are in Singapore. As you can see the primary carrier hotels from the right side of the chart uh, is the Equinix SG-1 facility and the Global Switch Tai Seng facility, both located on the east and western sides of Singapore. And, and on the third, you have the digital realty side at the International Business Park. But because of where the, these carrier hotels have developed, where all the connectivity has aggregated, um, that's where you've been seeing a lot of the new builds or, or the data centers that have been developed take place. Uh, and and you, I think you'll, be, you'll also start to see more and more data center development um, happening in the northern part of Singapore as you know, the east, east and western parts gets more and more uh, congested moving forward. So the reason why um, these care hotels have developed um, you know, we, we, we started off in the industry by, by claiming that carrier neutral was the way to go, that, you know, you have to be neutral to all networks and all, uh, you know, telcos essentially and have a, a ton of uh, options for your customers to connect to different uh, network providers. Uh, so carrier neutrality is now table stakes. Uh, or was table stakes. And then the new world that we're transitioning to, and, and I would argue that we're already in, is becoming uh, a cloud neutral, uh, is becoming more and more cloud neutral in the way we look at data center deployments. And so uh, cloud on ramps is a way that uh, your customers now can access multiple public cloud platforms, similarly uh, to how previously um, data center customers were able to access multiple international and local networks. Uh, now customers want to access as many uh, of these Western and Chinese uh, public clouds as possible. So, you know, Equinix, uh, Global Switch and Digital Realty uh, kind of have the lion's share of these pu public cloud on ramps in Singapore. And there's, these are some of the other data centers too that we're tracking. And so we take a, um, we take a look at all the number of peers and providers and internet exchanges in some of these data centers and we create a normalized ranking or a normalized score internally to rank these sites. So just to give you a flavor of where these data centers rank uh, in the Singapore markets, you can see the, the carrier hotels tend to be the ones with the highest um, number of um, ecosystem score. No surprise there. Uh, and moving on to um, the hyperscale side of things, I think hyperscale is a, a really big topic in Singapore, uh, just because a lot of these hyperscalers have built their own sites in the Singapore markets. So you have AWS, Facebook, and Google on the western, uh, sorry, on the eastern side, uh, on the western side of Singapore, and then you have Microsoft uh, in the northern part of Singapore. And because a lot of that hyperscale self-built capacity has been focused on those regions, uh, you've 
seen a, a kind of a surge in, in new builds coming from the Loyang area uh, with digital realty, SCT, GDC, and Air Trunk bringing online sizable amounts of capacity, um, you know, to predictably cater to hyperscalers looking to diversify their data center deployments um, across multiple areas within Singapore. So um, some geographical diversity there as much as you can within a small market like Singapore. Um, Tanjong Kling, you know, is a new name for the Sing what the, what used to be called the Singapore Data Center Park, and so uh, essentially, uh, to our to our understanding, all plots in the Data Center Park have been reserved by both you know a combination of hyperscalers and uh, data center operators, and so this is the latest that we have uh, internally with Facebook um, taking up the largest chunk of capacity there, um, followed by AWS and Equinix. Um, you know, Equinix has recently announced their SG5 build. Um, and then we have um, unconfirmed reports that there's an SG6 build underway as well. Um, Telling as well, one of the first co-location providers to build uh, in the data center park. So looking at the, land, the competitive landscape in Singapore in terms of market share, um, the way to look at it is on the left-hand side, what you'll see the ranking is for is for the currently built out capacity. So what's available uh, right now for customers to lease. Uh, or customers have already leased that capacity. And then on the right-hand side, what we call total capacity is what I referred to earlier and the way we measure the market is if all the land banks and sites under development and ex existing data center buildings were fully built out, that will be the ranking of the market share uh, that you would see um, if, if all of that capacity was fully built out. So the ranking is a little bit different when you look at current versus uh, total capacity. And so it's a it's a good it's a good mix I would say of both local operators like Singtel, Keppel, STT, GDC, uh, STE, OneNet, and you also have a good mix of uh, a global companies as well. The usual suspects: Equinix, Digital Realty, uh, Global Switch, uh, and Airtrunk. Uh, so looking at hyperscale, um, you know, we I talked about earlier that hyperscalers have built their own data centers in Singapore. Uh, and, and while that's the case, we don't expect them to build more of more of their self-built sites for over the next five years. Uh, we just think that you know they have uh, there's plenty of co-location capacity for them to lease from, and they're also focused on uh, expanding and deploying in other markets across the world. And so I think while they did did build a reasonable amount, reasonable amount of self-built capacity in Singapore, that they will continue to still lease from co-location providers moving forward. Um, as you can see, we. I've intentionally left out the names of the hyperscalers. Um, that's available in the full report, but I wanted to give you a sense of uh, how the market share looks like for, for the, the Singapore hyperscaler breakdown. Uh, as you can see, the difference between 2020 and 2025 is that there's a more even mix of hyperscalers. So uh, 2020 is more heavily weighted towards the top hyperscalers. And then uh, moving on to the next five years, I think you'll see a, a more even distribution of, of hyperscale capacity. So going from 114 megawatts of lease space um, to 200 and 46 and a half megawatts. So re we're pretty bullish on, on the, the way hyperscales are going to lease capacity from Singapore co-location operators moving forward is the main takeaway. Uh, so just touching on some key themes uh, for the Singapore market, I think many of you that, that know Singapore know that there's a current moratorium in place uh, that has restricted new data center development, but we believe once that is lifted uh, that there'll be a, a surge of new builds coming online. Um, and, and I think there's still plenty of runway for growth in the Singapore market, despite it having a lot of already data center capacity uh, deployed in the country or in the market. I think the, the demand is projected to remain really strong. Uh, I also think what, what you're seeing from, um, um, you know, we've, we've heard stories from both operators and customers that uh, because of the uh, security loss, the new security loss in Hong Kong, um, and the, the recent tensions there politically that a lot of providers or tech companies are considering um, moving out of Hong Kong. You, you've seen a publicly um, made statement from Naver, which is the parent company of Line, Line Chat. They have uh, moved their international backup out of Hong Kong into Singapore. So I think that's a, a signal that and a sign that you might see more of these developments um, um, take place moving forward. And so that's really good for, I think, the Singapore, the prospect for the Singapore market overall. And I think that'll continue to lead to more pent up demand for additional data center capacity uh, in Singapore as many, um, you know, Western companies um, see Singapore as a must be destination to establish their kind of APAC platform. 
Um, so I think, you know, Southeast Asia continues to mature and develop. You'll see other Southeast Asia markets grow, uh, but I think Singapore will continue to pull its weight moving forward. Um, back to the, where, the, where I was saying about the hyperscale uh, distribution becoming more even, I think right now the, the, the main hyperscalers that are deployed in Singapore are primarily the US-based hyperscalers, so AWS, Microsoft, Google, um, are, are kind of the ones that are taking the lion's share of the co-location capacity from a hyperscale standpoint. I think you start to see more and more Chinese hyperscalers deploy in Singapore. So the usual names, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, but also uh, some of the tier two uh, cloud and content companies like ByteDance and, and Kingsoft Cloud and JD Cloud uh, are, are examples of, of Chinese-based, China-based hyperscale companies that are likely to grow their presence in Singapore uh, in the next two to five years. And also Oracle, another US-based hyperscale cloud platform that has yet to really um, deploy a meaningful presence in the Singapore market. So we do expect, um, because there's a lot of providers um, in Singapore, we do expect more consolidation to take place, but only to a certain level, given that there's certain dynamics that may restrict uh, M&A and consolidation from taking place. Uh, we think that uh, the, the hyperscale um, demand in this market will be really healthy for the Singapore market moving forward, um, but also the way hyperscalers are purchasing capacity nowadays, um, they want to work with fewer providers and are looking to kind of streamline their vendor, vendor relationships to a select group of data center providers. So that, that may spur more consolidation to take place. Uh, and also, it's also becoming harder uh, for single site or single market providers to, to really differentiate their uh, co-location product offerings from other um, global companies like Equinix, Digital Realty, NTT, uh, and also Pan-Asian companies like AirTrunk and Princeton Digital Group and STT GDC. Um, so I think the continued maturation of the sector uh, will lead to more consolidation um, as a natural evolution of growing. Uh, and then, you know, given the, the, the need for, um, or, or the, the real hunger to invest in the data center asset class, you're seeing really high valuations for data center assets, not just in Singapore, but on a global basis. So that may spur uh, telcos and, and single site, single market operators to uh, consider exits and look to monetize their, their assets. Uh, so, so I think we, I've said a lot of bullish things about the Singapore market in the next two to five years, but I think, um, it's good to really take a lot much longer view of where this market is going to head in the next five, 10 plus years. So I think Singapore is a very small country. Uh, and, and I think most of you would agree that most of the data center capacity in Singapore is not there to serve Singapore, uh, but to serve other adjacent markets and countries in Southeast Asia and even India to some extent. And so as hyperscalers start to decentralize their, their deployments across Malaysia, Indonesia, even India, Thailand, um, I think you'll see them prefer uh, deploying more in-country footprints. And so that in the long term may um, sort of limit growth in the Singapore market moving forward uh, in the next call, call it five to 10 years. Um, and I think, you know, as they continue to fill their infrastructure gaps across markets across the world, um, that, that, that will be the dynamic that would take place uh, in our opinion. So um, Singapore, we, we think it's gonna be a very great, a very good market um, in terms of growth in the next two to five years. Uh, the next five to 10 years, growth may start to peak or plateau as uh, other markets like India uh, and Indonesia really start to grow into their own. And you're, you're gonna see more and more data center capacity being built in those markets to cater to in-country demand, uh, whether it be for latency requirements, performance requirements, or better, whether it be for privacy or data sovereignty type um, uh, requirements as well. So things to consider um, for, for the Singapore market in both the short term, medium term, and longer term. So true to my word, 20 minutes uh, presentation. Um, I, I would like to kind of leave the next five to 10 minutes to answer some of your questions. Um, if I don't get to your questions or aren't, aren't able to answer your questions, feel free to drop me an email at jt at structureresearch.net. Uh, we can follow up then. Um, this presentation was a kind of a tip of the iceberg of a much larger Singapore report that we recently published in July uh, that covers a lot more than what you see here. Uh, but what wanted to give you a quick, just some of the quick highlights of the report. Um, you can go to structureresearch.net slash reports to get a, get a list of all the reports that we published. Uh, we've done Japan and Singapore on the APAC side this year as an update. Um, and then we just published um, Toronto, Montreal as well. And, and recently we published uh, Paris, Marseille uh, in Europe. And we're going to grow our European coverage uh, moving forward as well. 
so let me take a look at some of the questions that um, we have. Uh, let me pull that up. And then maybe we can get to um, some of your questions here. I don't see anything pop up on the Q&A side. Um, okay, and I don't see anything on the chat side either. Um, okay, I'm starting to see some questions here on the Q&A side. So let me exit the screen. Okay, so one question is, um, which is a really good question. What's your suggestion for new entrants um, to the Singapore market? Um, so it's, it's a very competitive market, like I mentioned before, highly competitive, a lot of providers, both global and local. Um, I would say um, it's, it's tough to really differentiate the market unless you kind of move higher up the stack and offer, offer some, side of, some sort of a managed services um, type offering on top of just co-location. Uh, but given how how much pent up demand uh, there is in the Singapore market given the current moratorium in place. Um, it's a good time to be a new entrant right now in the marketplace. So um, the whole, the recent announcement of SPH and Keppel uh, teaming up together to um, launch a, their own data center in Singapore uh, could be good for, for Singapore press holdings in terms of uh, timing it at a good time where there's pent up demand in the market. So I think, um, you know, as, as the market is currently supply constrained, um, it's a, you know, it's an ideal time for new entrants to enter the market. But moving forward, uh, as more and more capacity starts to flood the market, it might be harder um, to really compete and it might come down to a more of a pricing situation there. So great question. Yeah, so got another question on the ecosystem score uh, on the interconnection piece that I, that I talked about earlier. Uh, I didn't really delve too deep on the methodology. Um, so, so I'm happy to kind of quickly explain the highlights of how we got to that ranking. Um, we kind of compiled uh, stats from PeeringDB and, and, and other kind of third party sites that do track the kind of peering ecosystem numbers like CloudScene and Inflect, um, kind of compile them all together into a normalized ranking score. So that's kind of a high level of what we've done. And in, in addition to what we've collected internally uh, from our, our own uh, internal database. So great question on that. Uh, so yeah, great, great question on pricing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really sensitive topic. And so uh, I'll try to be um, careful of how I approach it. But I think um, the Singapore um, pricing trend, especially for hyperscale, has been trending down over the last, call it two to three years. So, you know, if you look three years ago, um, pricing was about fifth, maybe 15% higher than what it is today. Um, and that's really driven by hyperscalers and the, the real competitiveness of new capacity coming online from multiple global and local providers that has uh, driven pricing down. And that's not just unique to Singapore, that's you know, happening across the world in all the major markets in, in Europe and in North America as well. Um, but the report um, in you know, our Singapore report really breaks down hyperscale pricing from large hyperscale, medium hyperscale, and also what we classify as um, non-hyperscale wholesale deployments, what that pricing looks like for, for that segment as well. Um, and then we break down uh, retail co-location pricing between three kilowatts, uh, a three kilowatt rack pricing versus a five kilowatt rack pricing. And we also project that over the next uh, five years. So, so great question on, on the pricing trend. Uh, so yeah, great question. Another good question. We've done, um, so you've been talking about US self builds in the Singapore market. Uh, have you heard about Chinese cloud players planning to do their own builds at some point? Um, great question uh, and, and a very relevant one. Um, so I would say that outside of China, I have not seen companies like Alibaba, Tencent and Huawei build their own self built data centers. Um, anywhere outside China. So even, and even inside China, when I look at the dynamic that's playing out inside China, um, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, JD, Pingsoft, ByteDance, um, they aren't even you know, leaning towards building more of their own self-built data centers. They're, they're looking to lease more from third-party uh, co-location companies like GDS and 21 Vianet. Uh, so I think even in China, if, if, I, if I were to see in the China dynamic that the Chinese hyperscales are building more and more self built in China, then I would be more bullish of the fact that they would build more data centers uh, of their own outside of China. But the fact that they're still doing a lot of leasing from co-location companies within China makes me think that they uh, may not do self builds outside of China moving forward. But I could be wrong. It's just, that's just my thinking on the topic. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, let me 
how do you see Singapore featuring in the in the ex China growth strategies of Chinese hyperscalers? Um, so I think Singapore is going to be, like I said, very a very good market for Chinese hyperscalers to expand into. Um, I think the the current political tensions between China and the U.S. Uh, and also some growing tensions with with European countries make Singapore kind of these this neutral ideal location for Chinese hyperscalers to kind of grow their presence as a safe destination. Uh, so I, I, I do think that Chinese hyperscalers will expand more uh, in Singapore moving forward. Uh, another question, do you see Singapore government uh, would build ecosystem with other ASEAN countries from connectivity or cybersecurity perspective? Uh, that's a great question. I th I do think yes. Uh, I think they should do it. Uh, I think the question is whether they will. is is tough just because um, every country has a diff different way of approaching uh, regulatory and compliance um, frameworks. Uh, and so I think as um, technology and the tech ecosystem gets more and more sophisticated and complex, uh, governments will need to start standardizing. Um, more on a, a standardized framework, whether it be in terms of data sovereignty, compliance, privacy restrictions, um, and, and being able to conform to a certain standard, rather than every country has, has a different standard for every for a different cloud provider or data center operator to conform to, that would make it a real headache and a nightmare. And you'll, I think you'll see a lot of pushback if every country will have to have their own separate unique framework. So I think it, it's gonna be good for the market overall, not just ASEAN in general, but maybe uh, globally and, and regionally if there's a, a shared and, and recognized framework um, for ecosystem and connectivity and security and compliance uh, moving forward. Uh, so yes, does, does your Singapore report include pricing references? Uh, we do not reference specific deal pricing uh, because we've signed NDAs with a lot of the companies that we've interviewed uh, for this report. And so we're only able to do it in aggregate. So we'll do a market aggregated pricing um, breakdown for uh, the Singapore market. So hyperscale versus, versus colo pricing. Uh, another good question. Do you see any constraints from power supply perspective in Singapore? Does Singapore have enough uh, sustainable power source for the next five to 10 years? Um, I'm not an expert on power infrastructure. I'm not a very technical guy uh, on the engineering side. So I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't say that I would be the person to speak to whether there's enough power supply in Singapore. Um, my gut, uh, my gut reaction is to that is yes. I, I do believe that there will be enough power to supply data centers for the next five to 10 years. The, the real issue that has really the one that's caused the moratorium to take place in the first place is uh, the CO2 and carbon emissions from the data centers that has caused the government to take a pause on, on that. And I think um, you're seeing more and more developments in terms of onshore data centers. I know Keppel is looking at to, to develop a floating data center um, campus on the shores of Singapore um, to um, help with the land constraints uh, of the market. Um, but given the, the, the way Singapore is located and its um, geographical um, location as a, a, in a tropical climate, it's really hard to get sustainable power uh, sources in Singapore. And so I think that that may not change in the coming years, but I think what you'll see is maybe you'll see um, higher rise data centers in order to maximize land use and then uh, onshore or data centers maybe close to the water to, to maximize land constraints as well. Okay, so I think we've hit the 630 mark. I know we have a lot more questions than I was able to respond to. All really good questions, um, but I think we'll stop there and I'm happy to follow up with you guys over email. Uh, once again, really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to you know, to attend our webinar. Uh, this webinar is recorded and will be uh, available to view on demand uh, later on. So we'll compile the video and post it on YouTube or Vimeo, one of those platforms. And then you you'll, you can be free to um, kind of review it at your own leisure. I know um, some of the slides I went through relatively quickly. So um, that will be available shortly as, as soon as we can get that up and running. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I appreciate your time. I know you guys have busy schedules. Um, so thank you for taking time to listen to our webinars. And I know there are a lot of existing clients that have signed on uh, to view this webinar. We appreciate your continued support. Uh, continue to stay safe and healthy and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.